Assalamu alaikum and welcome to In Conversation with me, Femira Qasim. Joining me via Zoom is senior United States diplomat and Sharjay the Fair for South Africa, John Groke, who has been engaged with some of the most important historical events of the 21st century. Welcome, John, and thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Wa alaikum salam, John. I went through your phenomenal bio and noticed that you've been involved in leadership positions in conflict environments in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as led programs in six countries. What eventually led you to South Africa? Well, South Africa is a pivotal country in the world of development. It uh, particularly has serious health challenges, including HIV AIDS, and the United States actually has its largest HIV AIDS response program in the world right here in South Africa. And over the last 17 years, the United States has stood shoulder to shoulder with South Africa in turning back the tide of HIV AIDS. And now we're working together to turn back the tide on the COVID-19 pandemic. And throughout your various posts, so which position did you find the most challenging? Well, there's no doubt that the posts in the conflict zones, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, are the most challenging because you're trying to do work in a combat environment. But I would also say that my time in Haiti was also particularly challenging, yet rewarding, uh, the country had been almost destroyed by an earthquake, and yet uh, the work that we were doing, you could see the effect that it was having on the lives of ordinary people. So those, those uh, jobs are often the toughest, yet the most rewarding. And what does your current role entail in South Africa, especially now that Ambassador Marx is not at the embassy? Well, I'm, cu I'm currently the Chargé Affairs, Chargé d'affaires, which means that I am temporarily in charge of the embassy until President Biden nominates and the U.S. Senate confirms a new ambassador. So I oversee the work of uh, the operations of the U.S. Embassy here in Pretoria, uh, as well as the consulates in Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town. Looking at the Biden administration, what would it mean for the United States' relations with South Africa? Well, there's no doubt that you're going to see a lot more engagement from the Biden administration, not only with South Africa, but with the entire African continent. President Biden has a long history with South Africa, going all the way back uh, to the struggle against apartheid in the 1980s. He's very interested. Uh, we're going to see, as soon as this year, more engagement, even beyond the work that we're doing with South Africa in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Is there any latest new announcements of U.S. support for South Africa's COVID-19 response and the vaccination process? Well, as we speak, uh, I know that my colleagues in the United States government are communicating with their South African counterparts about the vaccine situation here in South Africa. Uh, we know that South Africa had some disappointing news recently about the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And uh, working together, I'm confident that uh, as the weeks and months go by, South Africa is going to be able to fully implement its plan to vaccinate all South Africans to protect them against this uh, malicious virus. In President Biden's foreign policy announcement, his statements were very firm about the U.S. handling issues with diplomacy. How does that, how does the president's uh, foreign policy differ from Trump's? <clears throat> well, what you're going to see with the new administration is a lot more multilateral engagement, a lot more uh, using international institutions and diplomacy 
to resolve international problems. And again, I'll use the health sector as a good example. President Biden has already announced the United States re-engagement with the World Health Organization. Uh, he's already announced United States engagement with the COVAX multilateral initiative to ensure that all developing countries have access to COVID-19 vaccination. So this is an indication of where this administration is heading in its commitment to diplomacy and multilateralism. Are you able to share with us what will Alexei Navalny's arrest mean for U.S.-Russia relations? Well, President Biden has made clear from his very first day in office that human rights, democracy, the rule of law are going to be high priorities for the United States government. And uh, the president has already spoken out about human rights and he's going to continue to do so, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Africa, or whether it's even injustice in the United States. He's committed uh, to human rights, and you're going to see more of this coming from the Biden White House. When do you expect all of this to transpire? We're seeing the new administration's emphasis on diplomacy, human rights, and the rule of law manifest itself right now. As you know, when the president came into office on January 20th, he signed a series of executive orders reflecting the priorities that we're talking about right now, putting diplomacy and human rights, racial justice to the very top of his administration's agenda. And you're going to continue to see that as the weeks and months pass by. John, will the United States be rejoining the Paris Agreement? The United States, I'm happy to say, has already rejoined the Paris Agreement. Uh, President Biden is totally committed to reducing uh, the damage to the climate, including through greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, he, that priority has been reflected in the immediate decision of the Biden administration to rejoin the Paris Agreement. That, again, is another example of a commitment to diplomacy, to multilateralism, and to the very ethic that whether it's climate change, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's HIV AIDS, whether it's human rights, we are all in this together and we all must work together. And that's the direction that we've been heading in since January 20th. John, tell me, um, with regards to the rejoining with the WHO and joining COVAX, when do you possibly think this would transpire? Well, it has already transpired. I know that the administration, I, I believe it was Vice President Kamala Harris who spoke with the Director General of the World Health Organization to inform him of the United States re-engagement. Uh, so it has already happened that the United States has re-engaged with the World Health Organization with uh, the, COVID, the COVAX Vaccine Alliance. And uh, going forward, the United States is full in on working with those institutions to address the world's common health challenges. And um, please share with us, what is the US president's policy for Israel and Palestine? What you're going to see is a continuing a perseverance, a continuing effort to resolve uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. And uh, again, uh, as we speak, the administration is forming its policy. You will undoubtedly see differences between the Biden White House approach to Middle East peace and the previous administration's approach to Middle East peace, but make no doubt this will be a priority for the United States, the commitment to a peaceful and just resolution 
uh, to the problems in the Middle East, including justice for the Palestinians, is going to continue to be a high priority for the Biden administration. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, the United States a diplomat and Shanje de Fair for South Africa, John Grove, joined us today briefly to give us an update on the Biden administration after Trump left. We'll have more about this for you in the upcoming programs. Welcome back. Uh, joining us for our second segment from the United States of America Embassy in South Africa is Shanjay the Affairs, John Grok. Welcome back. Assalamu alaikum and uh, thank you for having me on your show. Wa alaikum salam, Shanjay. Um, during former President Donald Trump's time in office, more than 5,000 migrant children were reportedly separated from their parents when they entered the country. And more than 1,000 parents were reportedly deported without their children. How does the Biden administration plan to resolve and reunite these families? The Biden administration is already on top of this issue. Uh, the president himself has designated uh, U.S. government staff to locate those children that were separated from their parents at the border so that they can be reunited. And as President Biden has stated before, he is not going to continue the policy of separating migrant children uh, from their parents. How long do you think this process will actually take? You know, it's very difficult to say because of course, uh, the people who are working on this have to identify the children and identify the parents and bring them back together. But I'm confident that uh, if they work hard, if they persevere, they'll be able to do this. And this story will have a happy ending. Um, before that happy ending, um, like children could have gone through a lot of trauma or psychological um, uh, concerns during that process. Will there be some sort of um, treatment or is there some sort yeah. of treatment underway at the moment? Yes, that's a good question. My understanding is that uh, there are going to be social services devoted to these children uh, in recognition of the fact that they may have been affected in a bad way uh, by the separation policy. Uh, and as I said before, President Biden is committed to addressing this problem and having it solved as quickly as possible. So what you're saying is there, there wasn't any social uh, counseling happening previously? Well, th that I don't know, uh, but I don't believe that there was. Uh, but the good news is uh, under the new administration, there will be social services provided to these children. And as you said, in many cases, they'll need uh, social services. And will there be some sort of restitution um, envisaged, uh, for example, uh, citizenship or compensation or even perhaps jobs for the, for the adults? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, I'm sure that uh, those types of remedies are being discussed. And uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, we'll know what the uh, new administration has planned. But, but let me add this. Uh, the new administration has made it clear that immigrants are welcome. Uh, you probably read that President Biden recently lifted uh, the uh, number of refugees that would be admitted to the United States. Uh, that brings us back uh, to a time when the United States was more welcoming to refugees. And I think that's something that we can all be proud of. And in general, uh, President Biden and the new administration recognizes the importance of immigration to the prosperity of the United States. I can tell you myself, I'm a first generation uh, American. My parents were immigrants. Both of my children are immigrants. So America is very much a country of immigrants. It's a country that traditionally has welcomed immigrants. And we're seeing now with the new administration 
that policy coming back. Looking at the um, immigrant issue, how many new immigration policies were put in place by Trump and how many of them will the new administration be working on reversing? Well, some of those, some of those policies that the previous administration implemented have been reversed by executive orders. Other, others have not, but the president is seeking to address the immigration issue through legislation. And of course, that requires a majority in both houses of Congress to pass a law uh, that would bring the changes that uh, the administration wants to see. And, and again, what President Biden wants is not only a more open and welcoming immigration system, he wants one that's more humane. And right now we're seeing a policy that is more humane, in particular, the way that the United States is handling those who appear on its uh, southern border. I'm very confident that in the months and the weeks and the years ahead, you're going to see a more relaxed immigration policy, a more welcoming policy, and a return uh, to, to America's status as a beacon of hope for immigrants all over the world. Shaje Grog, you were talking about the increase in the number of refugees. According to reports, uh, President uh, Joe Biden, he pledged to increase the number of refugees who could be admitted into the U.S. When is the determination of the refugee cap expected to be signed officially? Well, it's, it's way too early to say that because it all depends on the number of refugees who are going to be placed in the United States. Undoubtedly, we will not know until much later in the year when that cap will be hit. But rest assured, the United States now has increased that cap and we'll be seeing more refugees uh, coming into the United States uh, starting now because that policy is now in effect and America's role as a country of welcome uh, to refugees is back. And that's something that we can all be happy about. Uh, before I joined the government, uh, I actually, uh, in, the, in the NGO sector, I worked uh, with helping refugees get to the United States. Uh, you may not know that my wife uh, worked on the US refugee resettlement program when we were posted in West Africa, helping refugees from Liberia and Sierra Leone get to the United States. This is an issue that's very close to my heart. Uh, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to many Americans. And we're very proud uh, to see that there's going to be an increase in the number of refugees admitted to the United States. And would your experience uh, to, to increase the number of refugees and with your own experience, what is, was it like some sort of checklist that needs to be done? Well, those who are claiming asylum or who have refugee status need to demonstrate that they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their homeland for which their government cannot provide protection or a remedy. And there are five enumerated categories of persecution, race, ethnicity, religion, uh, social status, politics, and of course, we see now throughout the world that there are millions of refugees all over the world. And the United States is now going to be accepting its share of those refugees. Given so much of the instability that we've seen in the world uh, because of war, because of natural disaster, it's so important for those of us who, uh, who do have an opportunity uh, to live comfortably in a developed country or even some developing countries, it's so important for us to realize that there are those who are less fortunate, who are vulnerable to persecution. We need to reach out a hand and help them and welcome them. And that is what the United States is going to be doing. And from this trend, which country do you see more refugees actually coming from? I don't know currently what the numbers look like, but clearly 
Uh, the worst places are going to be the countries where there's a lot of instability. Uh, here in Africa, we have Congo. Now we have a conflict in Ethiopia. Of course, we have the long running conflict and now famine in Yemen. But there are other countries where we're seeing discrete minorities being persecuted, perhaps because of their ethnicity or their religion or their political views. And we need to be sensitive uh, to that as well. And by the way, that's why it's so important that this refugee issue be addressed multilaterally. No one country can accept all refugees or address the refugee problem. And we're seeing President Biden and the United States now re-engaging multilaterally with its European partners, with its partners in Latin America, here in Africa and elsewhere, uh, with a recognition that the international community needs to work together in order to address these problems. Um, there was a video which was um, going around social media where um, President uh, Biden, he, he, he condemned uh, that time the apartheid that was going on in South Africa. What sort of plans does he have in terms of peace in Africa? I'm glad that you raised that video because um, I was just talking to a friend of mine here in South Africa recently, and he said, did you know that President Biden spoke out against apartheid way back in the 1970s and 1980s. And I had forgotten about that. And I thought, yes, he did. I remember the video where he was questioning a witness on US policy. And so what we're seeing now, then Senator Biden is now President Biden. So he brings with him decades of knowledge and experience not only about South Africa, but about the African continent in general. Uh, President Biden understands South Africa. He understands the history of apartheid. He understands the way so many South Africans have suffered. And that knowledge and that experience is the key to opening the door for improved relations between our two countries. And rest assured, President Biden and his administration is already engaging uh, more extensively, not just with South Africa, but with all of the nations of Af Africa. And we're seeing it most clearly with the response to COVID-19, with the support, the cooperation and the coordination between the United States and South Africa to address the COVID problem here in South Africa. Ambassador, I'm going to come back to you on that point. Uh, we're just going to join, have a, a small ad break. Welcome back. Joining us via Zoom is Sharjah the Affairs, John Grog. Uh, Sharjah, we were speaking earlier on about the video of Biden. Can you tell us more about the plans that the administration will have for Africa? As an example, one of the lessons that we have all learned from the COVID-19 pandemic is that no one country or even group of countries alone can solve the pandemic. We are all in this together. And if we don't have a common solution that involves all the nations of the world, we are not only going to fail to control COVID-19, we will fail when the next epidemic emerges, emerges. So President Biden recognizes this. So global health security is now one of his most important priorities. And as part of that, he wants to engage extensively with countries throughout the world, including here in Africa, to make sure that there are common protocols, that there's financing and a common response to the next pandemic that will emerge. And President Biden has spoken not only with his words, but he has spoken with the United States wallet. For example, 
Just two weeks ago, he announced that the United States is prepared to commit 60 billion rand to the COVAX International COVID-19 Vaccine Facility, which will ensure that COVID-19 vaccine that is produced is also distributed fairly to all countries throughout the world, including those developing countries that do not have the resources to purchase or deploy the vaccine on its own. That is a great example of a leader not only talking the talk, but putting the resources up to demonstrate a true multilateral commitment. And as I said, it doesn't end there. We've seen COVID-19 and what it can do. We've seen Ebola and what it can do. And we've seen HIV AIDS and what it can do. And only by working together can we solve these problems. And that's what the new administration in Washington is doing. So in terms of the U.S. engagement in its efforts to assist with the vaccine globally, so they're only giving that, they're giving the 60 billion rands, but how are they going to distribute it toward the countries and which countries will they distribute it to? Well, this, these decisions are going to be made multilaterally, including by the entities that are responsible for COVAX, that's the World Health Organization and the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. Uh, they will be responsible for ensuring that vaccine is produced, that it is stored and prepared properly, and that is, it is deployed particularly to the 92 countries that are going to be in need of the vaccine. So what the United States has done, it has taken its $60 billion uh, 60 billion rand contribution. Uh, it's going to be in two tranches and it will be put into a larger pool with other funds, including from other donors that will contribute towards this initiative. But separately, I would like to add that to date, the United States has invested about 750 million rand just here in South Africa to combat COVID-19. This amount includes 1,000 state-of-the-art ventilators. It includes three state-of-the-art field hospitals in Mafikeng, in the Eastern Cape, and in the Free State. It involves thousands of pieces of equipment, personal protective equipment, for example, oxygen storage tanks for those uh, who need oxygen therapy, and most importantly, training for South African healthcare workers who need, who need to learn how to operate this state-of-the-art technology. I'll tell you, I'm so impressed, and I've been doing this for a long time, uh, with, with funding from the United States, thousands, thousands of South African healthcare providers have been trained virtually in how to operate the state-of-the-art equipment, including the ventilators. Because, you know, one of the problems we see is sometimes people will bring in expensive and new technology, and there aren't the people who know how to operate it. Well, that didn't happen here in South Africa. South Africans stepped up, their healthcare workers stepped up, and with assistance from the United States, they can use that equipment. In my 26 years of experience in doing development work, the cooperation and coordination between the United States and South Africa in addressing COVID-19 here in South Africa is a notable success and really has many lessons for how bilaterally addressing global pandemics like COVID-19 should be done. This is an example here in South Africa of what successful bilateral cooperation in the health sector looks like. And Chaji uh, Grok, are you, are you aware of any, um, the amount of vaccines planned for South Africa? Well, South Africa now is in the process of obtaining its own vaccine from multiple sources. I believe there's Johnson & Johnson, uh, there's Pfizer, uh, and it is uh, 
It is importing these vaccines from multiple store, uh, sources. Uh, the United States is in discussions with South Africa about potentially receiving some vaccine from the United States, but right now it's premature to speculate on how much, if any, vaccine would come directly from the United States government. Please be assured that the United States government is very aware and very sensitive to the needs of South Africa. And uh, we are here to help. We are going to continue to help. We're continuing with discussions. We're going to add to the 750 million Rand. And hopefully in the coming weeks, there'll be more clarity on the vaccine issue. With regards to the field hospitals made to South Africa by the United States, could you share more details on exactly, you mentioned Mahi King, uh, what are the other areas where the field hospitals were donated to South Africa? It's the Eastern Cape and also the Free State. And these are provinces where, particularly during the surge, the first and second stage of the surge, there just were not enough hospital beds in the regular municipal hospitals to be able to care for patients that were, were sick with COVID. These field hospitals are amazing because what they're able to do is to segregate patients according to whether or not they, are, they need invasive or non-invasive treatment. Uh, some patients need to go on ventilators or they need oxygen therapy and so and some patients have COVID, some patients may only have uh, slight symptoms of COVID. So patients have to be segregated. They have to be protected uh, from spreading the disease or getting the disease. Healthcare workers have to be protected. And it's amazing that the way that these hospitals can be set up in the field, can treat COVID victims, and yet continue to protect all of the patients and all of the uh, healthcare workers who are working in there. So again, hospital beds, personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, gowns, oxygen, these are all the types of equipment necessary to be able to make these field hospitals operational. Thank you so much, Ajay, for that. Uh, thank you to the U.S. for supplying that to South Africa. Now, in terms of maintenance and management of those field hospitals, whose responsibility will this be? Ultimately, the government of South Africa will be responsible for the long-term operation and maintenance of these field hospitals because they were given to the government of South Africa as gifts. But... As I mentioned earlier, oftentimes there's training that's needed to be able to ensure the durability, particularly of state-of-the-art equipment. The United States remains committed to working with and helping South African healthcare workers, the National Ministry of Health, provincial ministries of health to ensure that their staff know how to operate these field hospitals to ensure their durability and perhaps even be, be used again if there's another COVID surge here in South Africa or God forbid, there's another pandemic that were to hit the country sometime in the future. So uh, the facilities uh, are going to be like permanent, it's a, it's a permanent donation to South Africa. That is absolutely correct. And ultimately, it's the government of South Africa that will have to determine uh, where they want to deploy the hospital if and when the COVID-19 pandemic is under control here in South Africa. And what were the facilities previously used for? Oh, these are, these are new facilities. They were not previously used. This was equipment that was brought in here to South Africa specifically to be used for the first time as a field hospital. Uh, in one case, in the case of Mahi Keng, it was actually the construction of a facility. Um, I recall that the field hospital down in the Eastern Cape consists of equipment that was deployed to a vacated, a large vacated building. 
So the government of South Africa will have to decide for itself how it ultimately wants to use that equipment when the COVID-19 vi virus has finally been conquered. Okay, we're going to take a short ad break now. Welcome back. And joining me via Zoom is the U.S. Embassy to South Africa, Shade the Affairs, John Groke, who's unpacking the Biden administration with us. Shade, uh, welcome back. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. The, you know, Shanjay, there was a lot of uh, videos going around on social media uh, during the Trump reign about uh, white supremacy basically resurfacing and uh, where the KKK members threatened to start and continue again. How does the president's administration plan to protect lives uh, against the KKK? Femida, just like South Africans, Americans are enormously proud of their constitutional republic, of our freedoms. Uh, we, really, we really do see that as our most valuable asset. And any time that comes under threat, it's something that alarms all of us. And recognizing what happened on January 6th in our capital, President Biden and his administration are determined to ensure that those responsible for violence will be brought to justice. And as part of this, as both the president and his attorney general have made clear, those who advocate violent extremism will now uh, be watched very closely. And those who threaten our freedoms, those who threaten the institutions of our constitutional democracy will be put on notice uh, that they will be held fully accountable for what they do. So yes, uh, this is an issue very much at the forefront of President Biden's uh, priorities. He has let it be, be known not only public, not only in public, but to those of those, to those of us in the United States government that violence, intolerance, belligerent, and deviv divisive language will not be tolerated. And trust me, that is a message that all of us want to hear uh, because th these types of incendiary and inflammatory posts and statements, that is not uh, the direction that we want our country to go in. And in terms of the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, has there been some sort of um, discussion with the organizers of that movement? I don't know if there's been a discussion with the organizers, but I can tell you that racial justice, again, is among the highest priorities of President Biden. He understands uh, that there are Americans, just, you know, despite all the great progress that we've made, over the decades, there are still Americans who are not treated fairly because of their race. This is a journey. Uh, we have not yet reached the end of that journey. We have to keep at it. Uh, we have to stay uh, faithful to our values. Uh, we have to be aware that our country does have shortcomings, particularly when it comes to race, and that it's the responsibility of all of us to make America a more tolerant, more welcoming place where everybody, regardless of race, ethnicity, or religion, has a fair and equal chance to succeed. President Biden understands this, and uh, he has made it clear to all of us and to the American people that this is one of his highest priorities. Shandi, um, when do you think international uh, borders will open for immigrants to just to visit? Well, in the United States right now, uh, United States borders are open for immigrants or non-immigrants who want to visit. The issue is there are certain countries like South Africa for which uh, there are uh, certain limitations 
Uh, you, for example, those who have been physically present in South Africa for uh, 14 days prior to the United States cannot enter. But as we see, uh, hopefully, the COVID pandemic begin to recede uh, with all of the safeguards that we've put in place, uh, not only here in South Africa, but in the United States, physical distancing, mask wearing, hygiene, and now vaccines, I'm confident that the very specific and limited immigration restrictions we've seen in re recent months will be rolled back and international travel will resume to normalcy. And in terms of entry into the country, um, will just the certificate uh, of being um, COVID uh, 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 negative uh, be accepted or will there be a request for vac a person to be vaccinated before entering the country? That remains to be seen. When or as the, vi as the virus is rolled back and as international travel resumes to a state of normalcy, countries like the United States, like South Africa, will determine the proper protocols for those who want to enter the United States or, or any other country in the world. Okay, lastly, Shaje, um, uh, Iran and the U.S. remain at odds over Tehran's nuclear program. What do you think is needed to bridge that gap? We're seeing President Biden put a new emphasis on a negotiated solution, a multilateral solution, not only to uh, the issues concerning Iran, but broader issues, whether they're in the Middle East or in the world more generally. Uh, like you, uh, we all hope that uh, the tension between the United States and Iran can be lessened uh, and that we can see further progress towards a lasting peaceful settlement, not only uh, in the Middle East, but in other conflicts throughout the world. You've seen only in the very short time that President Biden has been in office, his commitment to multilateralism, his commitment to the peaceful resolution of international conflicts is unwavering. Thank you so much for your time, Shaji. We wish you a pleasant day. Enjoy. Thank you so much for having me on your show. That was a U.S. Embassy for South Africa, Shaji, the affairs, John Groke. Do join us next week when we'll have more guests to talk to.